So I'm not looking for certainty. I'm not trying to make sure every decision is the right decision. I'm trying to make sure most of them seem to be. And the ones that aren't, they just aren't. And you, you, you do them and you move on. And sometimes you don't know they were good or bad until you know, six months later, if you even look backwards. So we don't have KPIs. We don't have OKRs. We're not growth-based. We're not like trying to hit growth targets. We're, we're, we don't work that way. We're just trying to make the best product we know how to make based on our own perspective, things we hear from customers, insights, intuition, a million other inputs that we don't even recognize. And we let the chips fall where they may. And um, keep your ears open, your eyes open, and, and you sort of adjust as you go. And you don't get too stuck in anything. That's the beauty of making a lot of small decisions versus a handful of huge ones. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Boundaryless Conversations podcast. On this podcast, we meet with pioneers, thinkers, and doers, and we uh, talk about the future of business models, organizations, markets, and society in this uh, rapidly changing world. Today, I'm joined by my regular co-host, uh, my colleague at Boundaryless, Shruti Prakash, who is joining at 2 a.m. in the night uh, from Jakarta. Hi, everyone. Uh, Shruti, thank you so much for, for your effort. And uh, uh, to be honest, I can't uh, really contain the excitement because today we have on the podcast uh, someone who has been uh, constantly recognized for at least 20 years as a unique voice, I would say as a flagship of uh, critically thinking about startup culture, product design, organizational development and culture. We have with us uh, Jason uh, Fried. Is it is it right, Jason? Jason Fried or Fried? Jason Fried, yes. Fried, right. Fried. Yep. Okay, sorry. I mean, my as an Italian, nobody pronounces my surname and name well when I do interviews. So that's totally fine. Not a problem. I get it. Welcome to the podcast, Jason. It's more than a pleasure to have you. For the ones that don't don't know you, uh, let's say that you are a co-founder of Thirty Seven Signals, a company that makes Basecamp, which is a pioneering web-based uh, project management tool. Uh, hey, which is a premium email service uh, premise that I would say in, on privacy and user control, uh, more or less. And you're also working on a new suite of uh, products, which is called uh, Ones, that I would like to talk about during the conversation today. Uh, you're also a, a, not, not only an entrepreneur, but an author. I remember, uh, I think it was something like 15 or 16 years ago, I was reading your books and uh, uh, as, a, as a young professional, uh, trying to get everybody excited about rework. And, and it was uh, probably the start, let's say, of something that then led me to become what, what I am and the company that I founded. So I'm really, I, I think I owe you something from this perspective. So uh, great to have you uh, today. So it, it's hard to make an original conversation with you because you are so vocal online that uh, uh, you gave so much back to the community that um, uh, it's it's hard, really, to push you to say something new, uh, which is something that I would like to do tonight. Uh, so as a starting point, let's say, I would like to to start from some of the elements of your, uh, let's say, the, the canon, which is uh, about uh, subtracting, smallness, uh, uh, short cycles, bootstrapping, all, all things that uh, make me think about two elements that I would like to, to ask you to talk about. One is what I call constraints. And it's really interesting because in complexity theory, which is one of our pillars, constraints are, always, are often used as a, as a way to generate innovations, right? So if you constrain something, it will flourish, it will innovate. And on the other side, I would say you also <laughs> talk a lot and base a lot of your work on, on an idea of restraints. So uh, limits and uh, prudence or, or something like that. So if you can talk about these two things as a starting point, uh, it would be great as a start. Yeah, sure, of course. Thanks for having me, by the way. It's nice to be here. Constraints are definitely part of uh, who we are and restraints. I, I like the way you put that. I, I have a hard time in some ways separating the two in my mind, but they are different. For example, we've stayed as small as we can on purpose. Now, that doesn't mean we want fewer customers. We'd like to have as many customers as we can. But as far as our company size, we've kept the company as small as possible. And that forces us to, it basically says we can't do everything we want to do, which is a good thing because there's a lot of things we want to do that probably aren't very good ideas, but we want to do them, but they're not that good. So it forces you into deciding what's worth doing. Every company is constrained in this way, by the way. I mean, even companies like Apple can't do everything they want to do, or companies like Facebook or Google can't do everything they want to do. But when you're small, 
really small like we are, we have you know fewer than 100 employees, um, you really can't do everything you want to do. And even the things you decide to do, you've got to figure out c- clever, creative ways to do those things with fewer people. So I just feel like that's a, a creative, it's, 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 uh, there's a lot of energy that comes from that, from, from this, this tension of not quite having enough, but wanting to do things. And then what it forces you to do is to come up with clever, creative solutions and also question things from a different perspective and see things through a different lens. Like, do we really need to do this that way or could we do this in a much simpler way? There's a three-week version of this, but maybe there's a three-day version of this because we want to do four or five other things too instead of this one thing that takes three weeks. So I just love working in that environment, as frustrating as it can be sometimes. I, I find it to be much more advantageous and much more interesting. And then, so the restraints for us, like we could afford to hire more people. So we have to put a restraint on ourselves to stay disciplined not to do that. So the constraints are the realities and the restraints are a little bit more like the self-imposed limits that we, we are often um, aiming for. That's a great way to frame it, I think. You know, so constraints are more like, as you said, the reality while uh, restraints are more intentions, right? Yes. Uh, which, which is, I, I think, very interesting because um, if, you, if you think about technology and, 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 you know, technology has changed everything and we, we never really impose any limit on it. So I think, uh, um, you know, your conscious way to look into limits uh, is, a great, is a great starting point to create something different, not, maybe not something large or or impactful, but maybe different, uh, which is important. You, you said something interesting that uh, we want to stay as small as possible, but at the same time, you want to have lots of customers, right? You want to grow your business, essentially. And I think I, I, I connect these uh, uh, with some of the uh, critique that you also raised recently with regards to some of your competitors that have uh, grown a, a huge employee base and uh, have a business which is comparable with yours. This week, we also uh, were exposed to the uh, conversation between Brian Chesky and uh, Lenny Raczynski, you know, recently. I don't know if you had the chance to listen to it, but I think it's connected to some, to some extent. So uh, what we are seeing uh, at the moment is that the product leaders are starting to re-centralize product leadership. And uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, the distribution of product management and product leadership that uh, emerged in the last 10 years now being kind of criticized and, and, and canceled. So how do you think about editorial leadership in products uh, and uh, really not scaling pointlessly product leadership across an organization? Yeah, I, I think that is an interesting trend that's coming back. We, we've, we've always been this way, which is a, a very centralized product development company because um, we're always small. I mean, we're, we're our biggest now, which is around 80 people, but we've, we've historically been significantly smaller than that. And mm-hmm. um, I run product here. I have other people I work with very closely on that, but ultimately it's my decision. I also own the company and I'm the CEO. So I, there's, it's very centralized in that respect. Yes. And by the way, that's not to say that I'm the only one who can do this. It's just that I do think that it is important to have a sort of a, a bit more of a singular vision when it comes to product development. Otherwise, I think things can go in a bunch of different directions. And I, I really, I haven't listened to the entire conversation that Brian mm-hmm. just had. I saw a couple of clips, which I really liked. One of them, he was talking about how his companies grow. They, they form departments and departments end up battling for resources and doing things yes. themselves because they can't get resources. And then all these different departments are doing things their own different way. And you could say in some ways, like you can make the argument that that's, that's like evolution and you know, the, the strongest will survive and whatever, but really it ends up being a mess practically. Um, I mean, evolution might work over billions of years, but like, you know, over the next four years on, you know, if you had five or six or seven or 12 different groups trying to do different things in the product, different ways, it's going to be pretty messy in the short term. So I I do think it's a good idea to to have a central vision for the product. And then of course, have very small teams implementing that vision. So for example, with Basecamp, we might have four or five different product teams working on Basecamp in any given six week cycle. We work in these things called six week cycles. And each team is only two people. It's one programmer, one designer, and they're assigned to a feature or three or four features over that period of time. And they're working on that. But before they begin to work on that, a few of us decide what work will be done over the next six weeks. Mm -hmm. So we develop this set of features or set of ideas, concepts, and then we dole them out to different teams. And the teams then implement those in their own way to some degree, but still always pointing back at the original idea. And then I'm directly involved with reviewing this work. So it's, that's how you, you can give teams a lot of autonomy, 
but they also have to like sort of report back to a an editor in chief essentially who sort of maintains a consistent point of view across the product so you don't have the product fighting itself by having doing things in a bunch of different ways so anyway that that's that's my take i think it's healthy i think it's easier for a company like ours i can't imagine uh, it, it must be quite challenging in a company of 2000 but also the other part is not really the necessarily the company of 2000 actually it's more how many products do you have if you have dozens and dozens of separate products it can be quite challenging to have you know a, a small team of people uh, directing all of those versus if you have one or two products it's quite a bit simpler how do you get buy in into this idea right like that to some degree it is going to be centralized essentially so how do you look at it in terms of alignment of goals within the organization and are these let's say driven by a customer centric perspective or a product centric perspective or does it go by intuition maybe i think everything frankly that's done by any human being is intuition it's informed by many yeah. things that you know and many things you don't it's like the conscious and the subconscious you know mm-hmm. that's how decisions are made so there's a thousand things pushing on you to make a decision and 996 of them you don't know what they are you don't know why they are but but they are and so at some point you make a call one of the benefits of working the way we work which is in these short cycles is that you can't really necessarily make bad decisions that matter that much so for example if you if you're working on something and you you make it something's going to take you 3 years to build and you make a bad decision you can be in really deep trouble because that's a long time to be working on a bad decision uh or a bad idea or whatever the longest we take to work on any individual feature is 6 weeks that's the longest most things are a week or two or three some are a couple days so in, in in many ways these decisions we're making are not that critical like if you make a bad one you get to make another one in a month and a half it's not that big of a deal so in in that respect buying is i mean look practically i, I run the place so like i don't need to get buying like let's just be honest i don't i don't mm-hmm. need to get buying but 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 that's not it's not about shoving things down people's throats it's like i'm trying to make the best decisions i can but everyone knows like you know some are going to be good and some are going to be bad and like some are going to be better than others and it doesn't really matter because what we're looking at is the sum total of things we make hopefully there's more good than bad and as long as we make more money than we spend overall we're happy so i'm not looking for certainty i'm not trying to make sure every decision is the right decision i'm yeah. going to make sure most of them seem to be and the ones that aren't they just aren't and you 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 do them and you move on and sometimes you don't know they were good or bad until you know 6 months later if you even look backwards so I will tell you that we're not, we don't have KPIs, we don't have OKRs, we're not growth based, we're not like trying to hit growth targets. We're, we're, we don't work that way. We're just trying to make the best product we know how to make based on our own perspective, things we hear from customers, insights, intuition, a million other inputs that we don't even recognize. And we let the chips fall where they may. And, um, hmm. you know, keep, keep your ears open, your eyes open, and, and you sort of adjust as you go and you don't get too stuck in anything that's the beauty of making a lot of small decisions versus a handful of huge ones so it seems like you uh do not have uh, KPIs you don't set OKRs you don't set the strategy and uh these two weeks uh, sorry six weeks cycles help you to to stay very connected to the to the user right to listen to the to guests so it looks like your your company or in general your products are driven on one side by customers uh, and and be in touch with customer feedback and very qualitative feedback not quantitative feedback that's right and on the other side uh, you seem to be very much uh, driven by how does it feel to to build the product am i right you're absolutely right i mean this is going to sound pretentious and i don't mean it this way but it's more of an artist approach than a business person's approach in a sense you know it's it's how does it feel mm-hmm. what does this thing feel like Uh, how do we feel about building this thing that that we're making you know it, it it is really about feel and feeling our way through the dark and feeling good about the things we're doing and sometimes you don't feel great about the things you're doing you don't feel great about everything sometimes you just got to like trudge through it but because we're we're self-funded and bootstrapped we don't have to do things to hit growth targets we don't have to do things to satisfy investors we don't have a board of directors we don't have to impress anyone else except our customers and ourselves i like that focus it's very tight very clear 
There's no abstractions there. Like if we don't make things that our customers like, they won't pay us eventually, or we won't get new people to sign up and we will go out of business. Like there's no one's going to come save us. No one's going to come pour another 5 million bucks in to give us another chance. So it's very direct. But that said, we don't always do things our customers ask us to do because our customers, their job is not to think about product development. Um, their job is to share their struggles with us. It's not even their job. It's just what, what they'll do. And we have to then synthesize those and figure out how to, how to build something that can help them. And it might not be based on what they've asked for. They might say something. We might go, you know, I think there's something else here. I think there's something deeper here. Uh, let's build this other thing that no one asked for, but I think it might solve that problem. Or we have just have a hunch on something that no one's asked for. Let's build that and see what happens. You know, so a lot of it is feel, and um, it's a lot of feeling frequently. And um, we don't make big, huge bets. We make a lot of small bets, and I think that that's uh, this, in, in many ways the safest way to work, and also the most enjoyable way to work. You really have to build this empathic relationship with your audience, with your customers. Uh, the fact that you're so vocal, so present, so connected with your audience, it's part of how you build products. It is. It's also like it, it's, it can be exhausting. And uh, sometimes mm -hmm. you just want to go into a hole and not listen to anybody because <laughs> <Like>, <laughs> everyone's got an opinion. And the more customers you have, the more opinions you have. Yes. And sometimes, you know, you just want to do your own thing. And, and sometimes we do just do our own thing, but we're always listening to people. We're always hearing things. We get somewhere around 500 emails a day. Uh, our customer service team gets about 500 emails a day. Some of these are, are troubleshooting emails. Some of them are feature requests. Some of them are ideas. Some of them are pre-sales questions. And you kind of have a sense of like the things that are on people's minds, the struggles people have. Um, I know a lot of small business owners. We make most of our products for small businesses and small teams. I understand the struggles. We are one of those companies. So we build stuff for ourselves and people like us, which also makes it a lot easier. Again, it's very direct. One thing I just do not like in business is abstractions. I don't like imagining what people want. I don't like having to build something for some goal that's detached from customers. I don't like to build something for someone just because it's financially viable for them down the road. Like These are abstractions. So we try to stay as, as close to concrete, real things as possible which is us, people like us, our customers, keeping an eye on our costs and our profits and our, and our revenue and all that kind of stuff, but all real stuff. And I, I think that just gives us the best chance of, of survival. And also, I like cars. I, I, uh, this is a weird tangent, but you drive a car from, let's call it the, the 60s or 70s, and you can really feel the road. I mean, you could feel the road. These are mm -hmm. analog devices. When you turn the wheel, the, like, you're literally turning you know, the wheel, literally. Today, you turn the wheel and a computer actuates this, and this motor that turns the wheel, you know, or you hit the brakes today and it's basically a computer s squeezing the brakes. Car from the 60s, like your, your muscles are breaking the car, you know. I like the feel of old cars for that reason. There's a lot of great things about new cars, safer, faster, better handling, all that stuff. But there's something special about being so connected and so directly connected to the thing that you're doing. And I think we try to run our business with that in mind. And I think that the larger you get, the more modern car you are in a sense where you're actually detached from the outcome of the things that you're doing. And so you end up measuring by abstract numbers and statistics and dashboards that are representing something else, but aren't really the thing. I just like to know the thing. This is your point about qualitative versus quantitative. I like to know the qualitative. I like to know the thing. How does it feel? So I'm ranting a bit, but that's how we try to run the business. No, but, but it's really interesting. You look like, uh, you sound like, very, as, um, I would say, as an abductive. Italian, you must appreciate this, I'm hoping, yes, with cars. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. Yeah. But I, I would say, really, as someone which likes to be embedded in things and, and feel them, right? And to decide through something that sometimes you cannot explain, right? an abductive decision uh, uh, process that you seem to embrace. And I have a kind of a small, I don't want to say provocative, but a deeper question. Do you feel like technology has gone too far? I think technology is going to go where technology is going to go. And so uh, I, I don't think it's gone too far. I think it's gone where it's going to go. And the, like the nature, what, something I've tried to get better at in my life is just to recognize the nature of things, uh, the, the nature of technologies it's going to push. It's going to push and it's going to end up wherever it ends up. There's, there's no going too far or not going far enough. It just, it is. So, so, and many things are like this. 
if you if you go to a, a mall with your kids and everyone's screaming and yelling and and they want this and they want that, like that's the nature of going to a mall with your kids. You can't be like annoyed at your kids that they want ice cream and they want toys. Like mm-hmm. that's what they want because that's the nature of that. So trying to understand the nature of things and then flowing with that. And, and I think that there's there's advantages to a lot of modernity, obviously. I mean, but there's also some really great things about what we're trying to call the Stone Age. Like let's call it 30 or 40 years ago. There's some wonderful things there too. So technology is going to do what technology is going to do. But I think also looking back a little bit is very handy to find things that were actually better before and not losing sight of the fact that just because we're progressing, it doesn't mean everything's getting better. There's many things that are getting better and are possible today that weren't possible before. But a lot of things have gotten more complicated today than they need be. And so to your, maybe to your essential question, I think technology has made a lot of things more complicated uh, than they need to be. But whether or not they're better is sort of a subjective uh, point of view. And I would say they probably are for more people. But I can definitely see some things have gotten more complicated than they need to be. And we're, we want to return some of those things back to simpler times, let's say. I think taking off on one of the points that you said earlier, right? I don't want to sound like it's some existential question or like, I like these existential from some... questions. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, if my my thing is, if let's say things don't matter in the larger run, right, larger scheme of things, then how do you build purpose, right? Essentially, if they are, let's say, more driven by short term decisions or short term impacts, right? How do you build purpose on a larger scale? Or is there some one thing that, you know, has sort of stayed through the entire, let's say, two decades of your work? Yeah, I don't think about purpose very much. I I think about doing the best work that we can. And the purpose of that work is is to build the products that we we build and take care of the customers that we have and to also uh, enjoy our day to day to uh, exercise our own creativity, to satisfy our own intellectual curiosity. Those are the things that really ultimately are the purpose. To me, it's all day-to-day stuff. It's not long-term future thing that I'm Mm -hmm. pointing at. It's now. Like That's what we have. We have now. And later will be now then. And that's how I've always thought about it. That's why I'm not a long-term planner. I like to say we've been in business for a long time. We've been in business yeah. for a long time thinking basically a day at a time and not 20 years at a time. I, I did not think about 20 years ago. Well, we're almost next year's our 25th year in business. So I didn't think 25 years ago that we'd be in business for 25 years. I'm like, can we stay mm-hmm. in business now? Great. Let's keep doing that. Eventually, that'll add up to something. But I didn't even mm-hmm. think about it. I, I wasn't thinking about what it would add up to. Just like, can we stay around? Can we stay around? Can we mostly do what we enjoy doing most of the time? Can we make really good things and put great stuff in the world? We put stuff in the world that wouldn't have would not have had existed had we not made mm-hmm. it. We have unique points of view. Let's put that stuff out in the world. It's not going to change the world. It's not you know some big huge thing, but it's it's great for tens of thousands of people or a hundred thousand people or anyone who who comes in contact with it who likes it. That's that's a day and a career's worth of of great work, in my opinion. It must be good to be you. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, well, tell me, do, do you are you why, why would you say that? Like, do you think that people focus, or maybe you focus too much on the biggest possible picture in the impact you're trying to have? Or, or is, am I just uh, projecting? No, I mean, I think increasingly so, it becomes future oriented, right? Which is where it's refreshing also to hear a perspective which is sort of against that, essentially. So it's interesting to know that it's possible. I think the leeway that it provides to be conscious about just the present is extremely beneficial. Yeah. I think that if everyone's really, truly sort of being honest, everyone does live day to day. Like You just kind of do. We can hope for something down the road. Like I hope Mm -hmm. that our stuff is successful. I hope that we stay in business. I hope our employees like working here. I hope our customers like our stuff. Hope is about kind of the future in a sense. But really, it's all built on bricks that are are laid down one day at a time. And um, mm-hmm. you know, the structure you end up with is what you you look back at when it's built. I, I don't have any idea what it's going to look like ahead of time. It looks like a very Taoist approach to be to building a business, right? So 
kind of trying to stay in the in the flow of things. Let's uh, depart from this um, more like uh, um, you know uh, teleological uh, element and uh, move into um, something more practical and also something that which is our bread and butter that is uh, building the organization right, and evolving the organization. You started from one product, and recently you have introduced, recent, uh, relatively recently, you have introduced an, another product, which is Hay, and now you are introducing another one. So I'm curious to, you know, from your perspective, uh, since you are very about, you know, not having to grow, and at the same time you are very editorial, uh, which are things that do not marry, at least from my perspective, much with the idea of building a portfolio of things. Or, or to some extent, I would say they connect because, you know, building a portfolio is a way to grow without expanding, uh, I would say, artificially. So building diversity of product re- resonates a little bit. But at the same time, I'm curious to know in building the portfolio, how do you leverage, for example, your employees, your, the creative power that they have? Uh, are you looking into empowering more of your employees to build more products? Essentially, because I see that the market is going in the direction of building more products. So companies will be required to build a scope, uh, economies of scope in products. So more products, more diversity, just because the market is going there. Uh, so I, I think that in the future of 37 signals, there are more products to come. So what is your approach, your, your posture towards how do you enable this diversification of products? Well, so when we first started, well, let's say in 2000, we started in 1999, we were a web design firm, but in 2004, we launched Basecamp. And then in 2005, we actually launched a product called Backpack. In 2006, we launched a product called Campfire. In 2007, we launched a product called High Rise. After that, we built, we built a job board. We built another product called Know Your Company. We wrote a bunch of books. So we've always made a lot of stuff. And then we stopped making a lot of stuff. We said, you know what? We're going to focus just on Basecamp for many, many years. And we did that for a while. And it worked out well. But also, frankly, we got bored. We got bored just doing yeah. one thing. I was you know? about to and saying that. <laughs> yeah, we're makers. We like to make stuff. We like, you know, you kind of, we almost repressed ourselves for a while. Like, let's just focus on, and the base camp got really, really good because all of our energy was on that. And it's still great. And we still improve it. But we also said, you know, we have other ideas that just bubbled up that we have to deal with. We just, we want to make this email thing called hey, dot com. We just wanted to improve email. Email was frustrating us. We did that. And now this stuff, this new category of products under the once O-N-C-E dot com label, we'll be building a bunch of things under that. These are just itches we, we felt we had to scratch. And um, again, we are like, we're, we're pressing ourselves for a long time. And at some point we're like, we don't need to do that anymore. Why don't we go back into making more things at once? Which is why we ended up hiring more people, um, which is why we're a larger company today than we were before. But it's, it's, just, it's just one of those things where it just finally felt right to go down that road again. I was thinking that uh, it would be interesting to um, hear your uh, perspective on uh, what is actually happening uh, in the market. So, as I said, you know, uh, you, are, you are more into building product uh, portfolios and you just introduced that, uh, you know, this topic. But basically, you can maybe rhyme with uh, what's happening in the market. So, you know, these trends that are pointing towards more composability, more modularity, um, you know, I don't want to weave the topic of Web3 and blockchain, but it's there, no? it's happening. So what do you think about, you know, how the market is evolving and what does it mean for a company like yours or in general for product companies uh, to uh, ride this evolution towards composability, modularity uh, and integration, uh, which is undoubtedly rising? Part of me wants to say, I don't really pay that much attention to the rest of the market because all that matters is that I can uh, make great stuff for our customers and find enough customers. So if, as long as that exists, the market is the market. Now, those customers live in the market and they have other choices. Mm-hmm. All that's true. I can't control the choices they have. They have the choices they have. And we have to just do our best to make the best thing we can. And I think oftentimes when you pay too much attention to what everyone else is doing, you end up building what they're already building. So I, I think there's mm-hmm. something good about a certain naivete and ignorance in a sense. <laughs> like I kind of want to live in an island, frankly, and like build our own thing. That said, you know, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on. I mean, the, the biggest thing in our industry, of course, is, is AI and integrating with AI and, and figuring out like how AI can really be valuable. I think uh, it's f- absolutely fascinating, obviously, and incredibly powerful. 
I don't really feel like it's clear yet. I know we all know sort of what it can do, but I'm not sure it's that clear yet, like where it's useful in business products. Now, some people might go, what are you, an idiot? Like, of course it's useful. It can do this, that, and the other thing. It can do this, that, and the other thing. I'm still not sure it's useful yet, though. Um, I think mm. it certainly will be uh, as it gets better and better and better and better. But I see a lot of it like being used for these very rote things like, well, it can summarize super long meetings and big documents. It's like, to me, yeah, I can. But like, is that, are, are you going to fully trust that summarization? If you're responsible for what's in that document, are you really going to trust that that's it? What if you miss something? And that, well, I, I, follow, I, I read the summary from the AI. It's like, well, that's, I don't care. I don't pay the AI to do your job. I pay you. So, mm -hmm. you know, these things can be helpful and, and they kind of, they look good on the, on the packaging in a sense, but I, I really still don't know if they're really fundamentally useful, really. That said, they will be, and, and we're keeping an eye on it, but we're also not jumping in just to kind of add summarization and automation to our stuff right now. I, mm. I still think there's a lot of value in, in humans. I'll give you a quick example. We have this feature in Basecamp called Hill Charts. Hill Charts mm -hmm. help you communicate to other people on the, on the team um, where a project really stands from your perspective. It's a hill and there's dots on it and you move the dots along the hill and the dots represent scopes of work. The computer's not moving the dots. You're moving the dots because mm -hmm. you have a perspective. The, the human perspective is important. You're working on the project. You know the project. There's a lot more that happens on the project that's not represented in the software. You maybe have had conversations with people. You've had other conversations with other people. You have other information to bring that, not, that the system doesn't know. That all goes into the subjective decision about where this dot goes next. I think that is very, very useful. Now, you could say, well, it should be automated. The dots should be moving along the line as more things are completed and checked off and whatever. But I don't believe that that actually represents where projects really stand. I think people know where projects really stand. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of power in, in HI still, human intelligence, because we all are humans working together. And we have there's a lot of things that just simply are not represented in software and in data uh, that I don't think are better off lost. I think they're better off promoted. Um, so mm -hmm. anyway. Long story short, fascinating technology, amazing, going to change a lot of things, obviously. But I think we're, we're just paying attention and meeting it with curiosity at this moment, but not like racing to implement. And by the way, frankly, like what everyone's basically just doing is working off the open API or open AI API. It's not like mm. companies are not really building AI into their things. They're like sending data to open AI essentially and getting stuff back for the most part. Mm. So, you know, it's very easy to add that and you can add it later. You can add it whenever you want. It's not like there's all these startups have this unique technology available. A lot of them just are using someone else's technology. And I think there'll be more mm -hmm. and more APIs for more and more big players that own large language models that you'll be able to plug into. So I don't feel like anything's really like anyone's missing out on anything right now either. Uh, maybe completely misguided a view on the market. I have no idea. Maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a dinosaur, but that's that's my point of view. No, no, but that's a good um, uh, leads into the next question that I would like to ask you about the post SaaS era, no? Because it's kind of uh, very representative of your, you know, your your position to avoid centralizing into a third party that uh, you you start to depend forever. But before doing that, I would like to ask you maybe, you know, what do you think about the uh, potential that AI has to Uh, become, um, you know, Alex Komorowski calls it uh, like kind of universal duct tape, right? The magic duct tape that can put everything together. It's fascinating because on one side, there is a treat of uh, becoming the OTT, you know, uh, playing over the top to every product. And uh, then the question for the product makers is, you know, how do you consolidate your brand? How do you resist? You know, and for example, I, I, again, to quote again, Brian Chesky, Uh, he said uh, recently that uh, he didn't join the plugin program from for uh, OpenAI because he wants to be own the brand, basically the brand experience. So I, I'm I'm also curious to know your product design perspective when it comes to do you feel like a, a threat of uh, AI becoming an OTT layer on top of all the products that can plug things into it, or do you believe that? Uh, Are customers buying Basecamp uh, uh, not just for the experience, but also for the 
mental structure. So for example, this idea of the ill charts, it's a, an affordance for intersubjectivity on a project, which no AI is going to fix. You know, it's, it's embedded in how you thought about the, the product and, and the kind of message you want to bring to the people. I don't. I don't know. Uh, I I do like this this idea of uh, AI being um, really damn good duct tape, though, and I mean that in the, like the best possible sense. The duct tape is incredibly good stuff. It's used for all sorts of things. It's the perfect solution for a million different things um, that don't have specific solutions for them. You know, uh, it's this general solution for a million great things. So I, I I think I think AI will will piece things together, and I think as companies use more and more separate tools in separate places by separate manufacturers and or separate producers and have separate interfaces and different data stores, like there's going to be a need for something to sort of centralize all this stuff and make sense of it all. So I think that's a great place for it. Organizationally, though, we've decided, like we use, we use Basecamp to run our entire business. All of our projects, all of our decision making, all of our ideas, all of our concepts, marketing, product development, everything's in one tool in one place. Because I, I think that centralization is important. And I think that you can use a bunch of separate things and then like hope and wish that there's something that's going to duct tape it all together. Or you can avoid the complexity of trying to find the duct tape and looking at a big mess of duct tape and just use one thing that works really well that has a lot of human subjectivity in it. Because I do believe that that is people working together. It, it, we're an organism. There, there's something biological about it, and it, and it's not always ex, explanatory. It's not always reducible to a summary, a, an insight from from something that's only looking at the digital information that it's presented with. I, I'm not even sure I'm quite answering the question, but I, I think um, I think privacy though is an, is is something people need to think about because right now mm-hmm. um, pe- people think about privacy, don't really care that much about it, and that's all fair. People can make their own choices, but. Right now, companies are sending a lot of data to third parties to, to process. And uh, I don't know if customers are actually aware of the fact that like, you know, a lot of their data is being sent to open AI to, do, to process something and then have it spit back. Uh, I think it's very important to be very clear about that. And um, again, we haven't done that yet. But if we were to do that, if we were to add a feature like that, we'd have to be very, very clear about it. I'm very much looking forward to your first experiments in AI. Uh, I'm curious to know what will uh, uh, come out of that. I, I am too, because I, I, I don't know what they'll be, but I, I, I kind of love to see something like, here's the human take, and here's the, here's the HI take, and here's the AI take. Like everything would sort of have two takes, two perspectives. Mm-hmm. Uh, and from that, you, you sort of, I think, get a, get a brighter, more beautiful picture, um, rather than going like, whatever AI says is the way it is, because it's so smart. Yeah, it is, it's smart with the data it has, but how does it know about that conversation you had over lunch that informs a lot of what you do moving forward? Mm-hmm. Maybe eventually we'll know those things too. Uh, I just think there's a lot more to it than just you know information. I think we wanted to sort of segue into to understand your sort of perception of what the future of SaaS is. And I mean, there are so many softwares now and super apps and multi softwares being used by each organization and then they have one saas product to control another saas product and so on so it's really reached its sort of epitome of usage right so when does it has it already become too much and if it has then what do you see as maybe the next steps i think there's definitely a subscription overload and fatigue for sure yeah a lot of our customers people who sign up for basecamp are coming to us because they've, they, they were using six other products uh, first. So they were using a to-do thing. They might have been using Asana. Then maybe they were using Slack too. And their engineering team was using Jira. Uh, and then they had Google Docs as well. And maybe someone was using Asana or Trello. It's like, whoa, th- that's a bad uh, recipe. Um, you don't need that many ingredients. Uh, and, and people are beginning to realize that. And what they've done is they've tried to piece it all together by like throwing all these notifications into Slack. Slack becomes the, the, the catcher's mitt. It's catching all the balls from all the different things and trying to make sense of it all. And to me, it's, it's, a, it's a, ma- a complete, unnecessary, complexity mess. It's more expensive than it needs to be. It's more complicated than it needs to be. You got to onboard people on different products. You, you let someone go. You got to take them off five or six different things. Like, I don't know where things are and which team is using what. 
I think there should be a wide variety, a beautiful variety of, of diverse products that address a whole bunch of different things. But I think organizations should think a little bit about what it means to have to uh, connect four or five or six or seven separate things together when maybe there's one or two things that work better together. I'm full, in full support of more and more products and more and more variety and more and more opinions and more and more perspectives. It's on the company to understand what impact it has when you sign up for seven or eight different things or even four or five different things and ask your company to work in a cohesive manner across so many different products with so many different ways of working and so many different interfaces and so many different users and, all, and the whole thing. So, but no, I don't think SaaS is over by any means. I think it's, it's going to remain very, very, very powerful thing. It's a very easy thing. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but I do think there's subscription fatigue. And if people start to look at their bills, which is what they're starting to do now because times are getting tighter, they're going to go, wow, I'm spending how much for that? Like what? I'm spending $2,800 a month just to chat with my employees. How, how come it's uh, free on WhatsApp is free? Like how come in the personal realm, it's free to chat with groups? Why, why am I paying three grand a month to chat with my employees that are also just a group of people? Like that's something's off here. And then I'm also paying this much for this thing and this much for this thing. Hang on a second. So I think you're going to see that. And that's one of the things we're trying to address with once with, with the new line of products, which is this idea that, you know, whatever happened to software you can own? Why is every piece of software rental now? And we're trying to make some stuff that you can own and you pay for it once and, and you run it on your own servers and, um, and you get your costs under control and you get them out of the way and they're in the rear view mirror. And you also get the code so you can play with it and adjust it and do whatever you want to it, which is also something that's been lost. SaaS is very much a trust game. You don't know what these companies are doing with your data. You don't know really who's looking at it. You don't really know what they're recording. And you have no insight into that. You can't see how the product works. You can't see any algorithms. You can't see anything. And you also can't see in beyond the product, like who has access to the database at this organization and all the things. Um, and so with, with one's products, you'll install them and you run them and you're in control of them and the data is yours and we don't see a damn thing. We can't do a damn thing. It's not on our infrastructure. It's all on yours. And this is not going to replace SaaS. And it's also going to be foreign to a lot of people who are just more familiar with and comfortable with SaaS. But I do think there's going to be a growing hunger for an alternative to rental. And I think ownership is going to be a thing again. Um, and uh, we'll see how that plays out. What are uh, the, the major uh, corrections that you put in place to ensure that uh, something like once uh, is not felt as a, a return to the past or mm. something that is not efficient, uh, uh, not uh, cheap. I mean, because if, if, I, if I think about uh, di market dynamics, competition, componentization, something starts as novel and ends up in being rental and, and then ubiquitous, you know, as a commodity. So yeah. when, when I first heard about uh, once, uh, I said, you know, somebody put this on a world lay map and it means essentially try to understand how this works from a perspective of value perception and uh, uh, evolution. So what, what are the major, if you can say, you know, because it's coming sure. up, it's a surprise, but if you can say something about, you know, how did you make it uh, relevant and how did you make it, uh, of course, you have to experiment, but how did you make it something that is not perceived as coming back to something from the past? I would say that we don't know yet. My answer is always, uh, we don't know until the thing is out in the market and the market tells us. Um, we have a hunch, but um, one of the things that's been hard about, it's been easy about SaaS is you don't have to worry about any infrastructure yourself. You don't have to install stuff. You don't have to know how to work servers, the whole thing. And for a long time, it was actually quite complicated to self-host stuff, but it's actually gotten a lot easier with things like Docker and there's some other technology that just makes mm -hmm. it much, much, much simpler to run server-side software on your own local server, it's not as hard as it used to be. There's been some major leaps. What have been a real hassle before is no longer a hassle. It's literally, if you can access a terminal on a server, which many people can do these days, type in one line, which will give you, you know, a command essentially, and it'll install, pull it down, install it, and you're off and running. You know, like it can be that simple. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, we're trying to bring modern interface design and, um, and, and concepts into these products. Once, by the way, again, just so people, once is the sort of the brand and the products will be in that brand. Uh, we haven't announced the products yet. There's just going to be one to start and we'll add another one, add another one over time. But um, we're trying to pick off things that people already know how to use as well. So we're, we're basically 
looking out at the market and saying, what are the products that are commodities? What are things that everybody understands that have been around for a long time, yet people are still paying luxury prices for? And that people don't have to relearn, they don't have to be introduced to this new concept, but rather it's like they already know how to use it, but now they can host it themselves, pay for it once and be done. And part of this is, is, is not trying to replace everything that these products do because they've all gotten quite a bit bloated. And I, so we're kind of returning back to this idea of 80-20, like the 20% that matters delivers 80% of the value, essentially, the Pareto principle. And we're applying that to these products. So they're going to be very, very, very simple um, and very easy to get started and very easy to get going on. And I think there's a real modernity as well in, in actually l- letting you have the code, which is a throwback to the past, but it's actually... I mean, it's more like, like open source in a sense, which is a very modern idea. And now you get to own it yourself and you get to ex- examine it if you want and see exactly how it works. And I think for product teams, even if they don't want to use these products, they're going to be priced so affordably that a lot of teams are simply going to buy them because they want to see the inner workings of how this product was made. You don't get to see that. You don't get to see how anything is made anymore unless it's open source. And when it's open source, it's not always the principles that are, that are behind it in terms of, of who's designing it and who's writing it. Beauty of code and efficiency is not always the primary objective. So we are focusing on building the purest, best products we can with, with beautiful, beautifully written code, beautiful design and beautiful HTML and CSS and JavaScript and Rails and the whole thing. And so people can really see what it looks like to make something like this. So I think being able to examine the inner workings will be very interesting to a lot of people. So I think it'll be an educational thing for a number of teams who are just curious about how this stuff works. I must say, this sounds very, very you, very uh, 37 signals, you know, because it's really creating an affordance for people to be involved, to care about their technology, to move from consuming technology to producing it and mastering it. And I, I think it's very interesting because if we, we, we have a mouthful of saying, you know, technology reduces barriers and so on, but then we just click and uh, instantiate products that we consume. While I think you are kind of creating a, a I want to say a, a hacky, hacker experience, you know, to some extent, like improving instead of customer experience, uh, you are moving into a hacker experience. And uh, I am very much uh, looking forward because I'm an open source advocate uh, since decades. And so it looks like uh, you may have kind of crack the code. I'm really looking Maybe. forward to see the ones. I have no idea, truly. Like, we do not have any idea how this is going to land. It might be a big thud. It also might be a big hit. I just don't know. We really don't know. And, and that's okay. Like, you know, uh, it's not a massive risk for us to do this. We had, a, we had an idea earlier yes. this year. We decided to do something. These products are being, basically going to be built ultimately with one or two or three people um, working on each one. It's going to take a couple months to do. Um, each because they're very, very straightforward and simple. So we're, we're going we're gonna to make three or four and see how it goes. Uh, I hope it does well. Maybe it won't. I mean, maybe we're too early. Maybe we're too late. I don't even know. Maybe that's the same thing. You know, who, who knows? Um, but but what's, what's important is that we're willing to take a swing at it. I think the industry needs it. I, I think that we've, we've become complacent. Everything is just like subscription. Yes. And there should be options. That's all. That's all we're saying is there should be options. And we're going to provide some of those options. And those who are interested in checking that out can check it out. And if you think it's a bad idea or a dumb idea or you don't like the thing, that's totally fine as well. Um, but options should exist and we want to you know, be on the record as producing some of those. So what we will find out. Um, and if it's a flop, like I wouldn't be surprised. And if it's a hit, I wouldn't be surprised. It's kind of a fun place mm-hmm. to be. And I like to be in that big unknown range. And it's something I said earlier, and I'll reiterate is I'm, I'm never interested in certainty. I, I don't. I, I'm not like we could have, could we survey the market and find out if this is going to work? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I doubt it. Um, I'd rather just build the thing and see what happens and, and not take a huge risk and not put ourselves at risk, but try something and have fun with it and have fun with the branding and have fun with the messaging and have fun with the idea and see what happens. Great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, people still uh, listen to, to vinyl, uh, vinyls, uh, so maybe, you yeah. know, it's, it's uh, also a vintage uh, feel to it. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's great to hear I don't know many times. Honestly, it's a <laughs> good, it's so motivating to hear that. And um, yeah, I mean, we uh, as we sort of near the end of the podcast, right, we wanted to hear your bread cup, breadcrumbs, as we call it here. So any suggestions on maybe books, podcasts, videos that you can recommend for our listeners? 
So one of the books I really recommend is actually this book. Uh, it's called Several Short Sentences About Writing. And mm -hmm. it's a wonderful book about writing sentences. So it's not about writing essays. It's not about writing stories. It's just sentences. And of course, sentences are the building blocks of all these other things. And it's just, right. it's beautifully written. It's super fun to read. It's really interesting and poetic and creative and clever. And I highly, highly recommend this book. So do check this out if you're interested in learning how to write a bit better or just curious about another perspective on writing. Podcast. I like this, this podcast called Econ Talk. Russ Roberts, I think, is the guy who, mm -hmm. who runs it. I think it's called Econ Talk. I like it because I like him as a host. He challenges his guests. There's a whole wide, wide variety of different topics that are discussed. It, it could be anything from you know, consciousness to wars to uh, technology to AI to politics to economics, whatever it is, right? Cities, all sorts of interesting architects. It's fascinating. So I really enjoy that podcast quite a bit. I, I, like, I like listening to that. I'm trying to think of other things that have really moved me lately. I mean, to be honest, like I just like to go for walks. I like to look at nature. I like to examine nature. As a designer, I've always felt like if you want to like see the best design there is, just go look at a leaf, go look at a plant, go look at a flower, go look at an insect. These are designs that have been perfected. We all talk about iteration. Uh, you know, these are designs that have been perfected over millions or billions of years. Like they're pretty damn good. They're the best they've ever been uh, right now. You know, and, and there's something special about that. And um, I like that. I also like to. I also like architecture a lot. So I like to walk through buildings. I love well-designed buildings and I abhor poorly designed buildings. And it's just nice to kind of be in a space that was considered. I, I, find, I think software is very architectural in that way. I think of software as a series of spaces and places, mm -hmm. uh, actually more so than screens. And uh, so I'm very spatial in that way and, and I enjoy going to buildings. So I would encourage people to take walks outside and walks inside. You know, uh, that, that's sort of my, those are my breadcrumbs that I'd like to leave behind there. Fantastic. Well, Jason, I think that um, um, we um, succeed uh, in um, unearthing some aspects of your personality and your your, your work that um, haven't surfaced so clearly in other podcasts. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, releasing this to our listeners. Uh, I'm so, so thankful for your for your time. So I hope you also enjoyed the, the conversation. Very much so. I really enjoyed this. The questions were unique and original, and I really appreciated that. And I felt like it was a conversation rather than just like a series of questions. So I, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed being here. Thank you for having me. I'm glad we could do this. Thank you so much. Thank you so of much. Course. It's been fantastic. And thanks for staying up late to both of you. Yes. <laughs> Very late. <Exactly. laughs> yes, I mean, Shruti. maybe mostly Shruti because it's 2 a.m. Yeah. on your side. So <laughs> thank you so much, None. Shruti. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks, Jason, for joining. It was very insightful. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well, thank you. For our listeners, uh, I'm sure you have enjoyed the podcast. You can look at, you can uh, head to our website, bundles.io slash podcast, uh, sorry, slash resources slash podcast, and you will find this episode with all the transcripts and all the um, links that uh, uh, of the things that Jason uh, just suggested. Uh, and until we speak again, remember to think boundless.